بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this gathering, to forgive our sins and our shortcomings, and to gather us all in his gardens, in the paradise, bi-ithnihi ta'ala, innahu waliyu dhalika wal qadiru alayh. My brothers and sisters in Islam, today I wanted to share with you about a dua And of course, this is one of the greatest deeds in Islam, a dua to request from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to supplicate Allah azza wa jal for all your needs in this life and in the hereafter. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, when he described a dua in a few words, he said powerful words. He said that, وَهُوَ مِنْ أَنْفَعِ الدَّوَاءِ That a dua is one of the most beneficial medicines. He said, it is the enemy of calamity. هُوَ عَدُوُّ الْبَلَاءِ It's the enemy of calamities. It removes the calamity or it cures this calamity and it prevents its occurrence and it reduces it if it was to befall a person. وَهُوَ سِلَاحُ الْمُؤْمِنِ And it is the weapon of the believer. And so today I wanted to share with you the conditions and the manners of a dua that shall never be rejected bi-ithnillahi ta'ala. And this word a dua when it is mentioned, there are two types. So I'm clarifying this so you can know what type of dua I'm talking about. A dua is of two types. There is something known as dua al-ibadah and something known as du'a'u at-talabi wal-mas'alah. These are two types of du'a. The first one, du'a'u al-ibadah, the du'a of worship. And so this includes our prayer, our fasting, our zakat, our hajj. All these things are known as du'a, but they are called du'a'u al-ibadah. And another type of du'a is called du'a'u al-mas'alati wal-talab, the du'a of request and asking. And this second type is the type in where you raise your hand and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is the type that we are going to speak about. Dua al-talabi wal-mas'alah. The dua in where a person asks Allah and requests from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what he wants in this life and in the hereafter. As for the first type of a dua, which is known as dua al-ibadah, and that is our salat. Our salat, yes, it's called a dua. It's known as dua al-ibadah. And when we fast, that is a dua. It's known as dua al-ibadah. And when we perform hajj and give zakat, so you might ask, how is a salat a dua? And how is our fasting a dua? Because when we pray, we are indirectly saying, Oh Allah, accept our salat. Oh Allah, give us the benefit of a salat. Give us its benefits in this life and in the hereafter. O oh Allah, reward us for our prayers. O oh Allah, forgive our sins because of our salat. We are indirectly saying this when we pray. So when we pray and when we do all the worships in Islam, they are known as dua. Because when you do the worships, you are actually asking Allah Azza wa Jal that he accept this worship from you and give you its benefits, and wipe away your sins, and increase your iman, and bring you closer to Allah Azza wa Jal, and to save you from the fire, and so on. Without directly saying these ad'iyah, without directly asking these, you are already saying this when you are praying, or fasting, or doing the other worships. طيب. Let's now focus on the second type of dua, which I said to you is dua al-talabi wal-mas'alah. The dua in where we're requesting and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded his slaves to make dua. And he promised to answer their dua. Allah azza wa jal, he said, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Allah azza wa jal, he said, your Lord said, 
Call upon me. Ud'uni. Call upon me. What did Allah promise? He said, I will respond to you. Astajib lakum. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ Allah Azza wa Jal said, If my slaves were to ask you about me, we're supposed to be asking about Allah, then, then, يعني, for Allah Azza wa Jal is, is commanding the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say to the people, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ I am certainly me. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ I answer the call of the caller whenever he calls. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُولِي So answer my call. Answer the command of Allah in order for your dua to be answered. وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي And have faith in Allah and believe Allah لَعَلَّهُمْ يرشدون, So that they may be guided. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ رَبِّي لَسَمِيعُ الدُّعَاءِ When Ibrahim alayhi salam made the dua, he said at the end of it, إِنَّ رَبِّي لَسَمِيعُ الدُّعَاءِ That certainly my Lord is Samia to a dua Now, as Samia, as Samia is from the names of Allah. It doesn't only mean that Allah hears. The word as Samia does not only mean that Allah hears our dua and our words. As Samia also means the one who answers the dua. He hears it and he answers it. Inna Rabbi la Samia dua Verily, my Lord hears and answers. And so this is why in our salat, when we rise from a ruku'ah, we say, That that does not only mean that Allah He is the one who praises Him, because Allah He is the one who praises Him and the one who doesn't praise Him. So what does mean? It means that Allah Azza wa Jal answers. The dua of the one who praises him. And in the hadith, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, uh, bika min dua in la yusma'. He said, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from a dua that is la yusma'. Meaning, I seek refuge in you from a dua that is not answered. We don't translate yusma' here as heard because Allah, he is a dua. But the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asking Allah to protect him from a type of dua that is not answered. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, Ud'u rabbakum tadarru'an wa khufiyah, innahu la yuhibbu al-mu'tadeen, wa la tufsidu fil ardi ba'da islahiha, wad'uuhu khawfan wa tama'a, inna rahmat Allahi qareebun min al-muhsineen. These are the يعني, two ayat in Surah Al-A'raf that are the most comprehensive ayat when it comes to the attitude and the style of our dua. Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, Ud'u Rabbakum, call upon your Lord, tadarru'an wa khufya, in humility, with desperation, wa khufya, and in private, silently, secretly. Innahu la yuhibbu al-mu'tadeen, Allah does not like those who transgress. In this ayah, the one who avoids a dua is a transgressor. Then Allah said, وَلَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ بَعْدَ إِصْلَاحِهَا Do not cause corruption upon the earth after its reformation. Meaning don't sin on earth after the prophets have come and clarified uh, the deen of Allah and how to worship Allah and how to avoid sins. So don't corrupt the earth with your th- sins. And then Allah said, وَدْعُوهُ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا and invoke him, supplicate to him with fear and hope in Allah Azza wa Jal's mercy. Then he said, Indeed, inna rahmat Allah qareebun min al muhsinin Indeed, the mercy of Allah is knee to the good doers, to the righteous. In other words, Allah Azza wa Jal referred to those who make dua humbly and in private, fearing Allah and hoping for his reward and mercy. Those who make dua with this type, he, he referred to them as muhsineen, as righteous people, as good doers. And so as a result, we realize from this ayah that the one who always makes dua and is attached to this worship of a dua 
in the sight of Allah, he's from among Al-Muhsineen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's just be clear on this. Allah, the one who commanded us to make dua in all these ayat that I just read to you, and the one who encourages us to make dua, we should know that he is not in need of all of us. And he is not in need of a dua, of our dua, and he is not in need of any of our worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as mentioned in al-Hadith al-Qudsi, Ya ibadi, innakum lan tablughu naf'i fatanfa'uni, wa lan tablughu durri fatadurruni. Allah azza wa jal, he said, O oh my servants, you will not be able to bring me harm, and you will not be able to bring me any benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in this same hadith, Ya ibadi, لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم كانوا على أتقى قلب رجل واحد منكم ما زاد ذلك في ملكي شيئا الله عز وجل he said oh my servants is the if the first of you and the last of you and the human of you and the jinn of you if you are all to be as pious as the most pious heart of any one of you Yani, if all of us were to have pious hearts like the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah azza wa jal said, مَا زَادَ ذَلِكَ فِي مُلْكِي شَيْئًا That would not increase in my kingdom anything at all. For this hadith is teaching us that our dua does not benefit Allah. Our worship, Allah doesn't benefit from it. We are the ones that benefit from our dua. We are the ones that benefit from our worships. So Allah Azza wa we said, doesn't benefit from our dua and supplication. However, he loves that the slave asks him and supplicates to him and worships him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more dua you make in your life, the more you gain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love for you. النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يسد ليس شيء أكرم على الله من الدعاء There is nothing more noble to Allah than الدعاء Nothing يعني the most noble deed is for you to ask Allah عز وجل and to make دعاء to Allah عز وجل والنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يسد ومن لم يسأل الله يغضب عليه That the one who does not ask Allah the one who doesn't supplicate to Allah, Allah is angry with him. Allahu Akbar. The hadith is sahih. Yani what does that mean? Allah is angry with the one who doesn't supplicate to him. Why? We learn from this that Allah Azza wa loves those who ask him. And he is pleased with those who continuously make dua. Why? Because when you make dua, when you ask Allah, you are actually acknowledging Allah's oneness. And you are acknowledging His Lordship. And that He is the Creator. And He's the Lord worthy of worship. And when you don't ask Allah, and you don't turn to Him, that's a form of arrogance. It's a sign of arrogance. As though a person is saying, I'm not in need of Allah Azza wa I'm not in need of His help. I'm not in need of his assistance. And whoever has this mindset, this attitude, Allah Azza wa Jalla is angry with him. So this hadith teaches us that when you make dua, you earn Allah's love and his pleasure. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. And there are many, many ayat and ahadith that teach about certain conditions for the type of the dua that is never rejected. And this type of study is known among the ulama as shurut al-du'a wa adabihi, the conditions and the manners of du'a. And they are extremely, extremely important for the one who wants to truly benefit from his du'a. If you want your du'a to be accepted and answered, you must really give importance 
to what are the conditions and the manners of a dua. And a person must also know the reasons for why the dua is rejected and keep away from those matters. So these conditions and manners of an accepted dua are many. And this is our lesson. We're going to focus on about 14 or 15 of them. That's what I want to speak about. The conditions and the manners of a dua. Because if we're able to uh, bring these conditions and manners alive in our dua, then that is the type of dua that would never be rejected and would be actually answered and accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, as I said, these conditions and manners are many. However, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah has an excellent summary in a few lines in where he mentioned the most important things that a person needs to know when making dua. And he mentioned them, and he, he mentioned at the end of his summary, he said, the one who adheres to these conditions and manners, his dua will almost certainly never ever be rejected. He wrote a few lines. However, within these few lines is an abundance of good and barakah. Subhanallah. And these words of his are found in his book, Al Jawab al Kafi, Liman Sa'ala An al Dawa al Shafi. This book is also known as Al Da'u al Dawa, and it is being translated. It's called The Illness and the Cure. So I've taken a small part of this book, and this is what we're going to explain. Uh, he, Rahimahullah, Ibn al Qayyim said, if all of these things, which I'm about to start and mention them with their proof from the Quran and Sunnah, if all these things were to be present while making dua, the result is that this dua will almost certainly never be rejected. Okay, first matter, and he began. He said, al qalbi that's the first thing when making dua. Pay attention. They are 15 things. We're going to go through them one by one, sharing the dalil and sharing the reason for why this is one of the types or this is one of the condition or the manners of a dua that is accepted. The first matter he mentioned is that your heart is present when making dua. So it's not just the tongue that is moving when you're making dua, but you must also involve your heart when you're making dua. It's because it's very easy for the heart to be distracted and disturbed and go, and go from one thought to another. So you must make sure that your heart is present when you make dua. And this is from the very first conditions of an accepted dua. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said concerning this point, he said, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّهُ لَا يَسْتَجِيءُ اسْتَجَابُ دُعَاءً مِنْ قَلْبٍ غَافِلٍ لَاهٍ And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you all better know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept a dua that comes from a heedless, distracted heart. So this means, this means, in order for you to achieve a present heart in dua, you must keep away from two things, heedlessness and distraction. What does that mean? What is heedlessness in dua? Heedlessness is when you do not acknowledge the greatness of Allah and the greatness of Allah's mercy. So if you make dua and you say, Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, bestow your mercy upon me. But in your heart, you doubt, mm, maybe this is not going to happen. I doubt Allah will forgive me. I doubt Allah will grant me his mercy. If, if that's your heart while making dua, then your heart is not present. Then your heart is heedless. So to avoid heedlessness in a dua, you must be certain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful, is greater than your sins is greater than anything you're asking for. And it is definite that he is able to give you whatever you're requesting. You must be certain. That's why the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ud'u Allah wa antum muqinun bil ijabah. When you ask Allah, ask him while you are certain that he will answer you. So 
Keep away from heedlessness. Because if you keep away from heedlessness, your heart is present in a dua. You fulfilled the first condition of an accepted dua. And the other thing is distraction. You must also keep away from distraction. If the heart is distracted, then your heart is not present while making dua. What does it mean that the heart is distracted? How do you avoid distraction of the heart? Two things. Number one, that when you make dua, you must make dua that you understand. If you make dua you're not understanding, that means your heart is distracted. Then you're not, you are not understanding what you're asking. So don't take a book of dua and open it and start repeating words. So you have no idea what they mean. That perhaps you know, it benefits you in the sense of hasanat, and, but your heart wasn't present. When you're making dua, you do not understand. Therefore, make dua that you understand. If you don't know how to make dua in Arabic, make it in English or in your language. This is permissible. This is fine. This is allowed. Even in salat, al-ulama, rahimahumullah, they said, if you do not know how to make dua in Arabic, then you're allowed to make dua in your language until you understand how to make dua in Arabic or until you learn it. So it is haram to make dua in other than Arabic in your salat unless you don't understand Arabic. If you don't understand, make dua in your language until you learn Arabic. So keep away from distraction when making dua. The heart should not be distracted. The distraction of the heart is when you make dua, you do not understand what it means. And the other thing is, don't be distracted with something in your hands. Yani some people, they make dua from their phone and they view their notifications or they go from one app to another or they're playing with th something in their hand. You're being distracted. Your heart is not present. And this is why one of the Salaf, rahimahumullah, he saw a person making dua while fiddling with pebbles. The little pebbles, he was playing with them as he's making dua. So he said to him, Irmil hasa, throw these pebbles from your hand and concentrate in your dua. Your heart and your limbs must be concentrating when making dua. Even that's the first matter. Let's summarize it. Heart must be present when making dua. That means keep away from two things. Heedlessness. Heedlessness is when you make dua and you are doubting the greatness and the power of Allah. Avoid that. And, 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 and keep away from distraction. Distraction is when you are making dua, you do not understand what it means. And when you are fidgeting with things in your hand. If you avoid these two things, then definitely, bi'ithnillah, your heart is present when you're making dua and you have fulfilled the first condition of an accepted dua. Second matter, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said, وَصَادَفَ وَقْتًا مِنْ أَوْقَاتِ الْإِجَابَةِ السِّتَّةِ And this dua that you make, that it be made during one of six times in where the dua is answered and never rejected. There are six times in when the dua is accepted and never rejected. So your heart must be present. Second thing you need to be concerned about is the timing in which the dua is accepted six times during the day and the night. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said, the first one is al-layl. The third or the last third of the night. This is the first of the six times in which the dua is accepted. And this is by far the best time to make dua, the last third of the night. Because this is a time in where there is no distraction whatsoever. And the mind is clear and it's fresh. And the only reason a person gets up in the last third of the night is to worship Allah. There's no other reason you get up in the last third of the night. Children are sleeping. There's no school. There's no work. There's no phone calls to answer. There's nothing of this worldly life at all. The whole the entire world is dead. So anyone who gets up in the last third of the night, his heart is already present and ready. 
And so this is why this time is a time of accepted dua. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, as collected by Al-Bukhari wa Muslim, the hadith is authentic. He said, يَنزِلُ رَبُّنَا كُلَّ لَيْلَةٍ إِلَى سَمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا Allah Azza wa Jal comes down every night to the first heaven. حِينَ يَبْقَى ثُلُثُ اللَّيْلِ الْآخِرِ in the last third of the night, he subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down. فيقول, and then he says, من يدعوني فأستجيب له Who will ask me now? And I shall answer him. Allahu Akbar. من يسألني فأعطيه Who's going to ask me? And I will give him. من يستغفرني فأغفر له Who is going to seek my forgiveness? And I will forgive him. Allahu Akbar. This is the call of Allah Azza wa Jal every single night in the last third of the night. Yani the idea is, if you're not bothered by your sins, stay sleeping. If you don't need anything, stay sleeping. If you are bothered by your sins, and, you've, and you're choked by your sins, and you've lost your mind because of your sins, and you are irritated because of your sins, then get up in the last third of the night when Allah comes down every single night and is asking and then he's promising to forgive and to give you whatever you want. Allahu Akbar. فَإِذَنْ Let's focus on this time. And I know this dua, this hadith, at the beginning of it, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, يَنْزِلُ رَبُّنَا Allah comes down. And so, of course, people enter in this debate of, does Allah come down? How can Allah come down? My brothers and sisters in Islam, one of the sifat, one of the attributes of Allah is that he comes down in a way that is befitting to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He comes down in a way that is befitting to him. But the hadith, the hadith, the purpose of the hadith is not to sit down and argue whether he comes down or not. Allah comes down, yes, full stop, enough. The purpose of the hadith is a spiritual meaning to teach you and I the importance of the last third of the night that we get up and ask Allah in the last third of the night. So do not delve into this matter. Do not delve into this matter. If Allah comes down, he doesn't come down. Madhabu salaf the methodology and the understanding of our ulama is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down in a way that is befitting to him. Unlike how you and I come down. If I am upstairs and I went down, I take the ladder and I go down. And that's called, this is the human being and how he comes down. We, we, when we say Allah comes down, we don't mean this. Laysa kamithlihi shay. There is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we say Allah comes down in a way that befits him. And don't delve too much in this matter. Focus on the actual spiritual meaning of the hadith. And that the last third night is a golden time to make dua. And a moment of an accepted dua. The second of these six times in when the dua is accepted. وَعِنْدَ adhan Immediately after al adhan and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrates, <clears throat> this is the hadith, a man came to Rasulullah and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, inna al-mu'adhinina yathbulu lana, that the mu'adh, those who give adhan, they have superseded us in, in, uh, in, in reward. They've earned a lot of reward. So what's for us? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, قُلْ كَمَا يَقُولُونَ Repeat after the Mu'addin exactly what he says. فَإِنْ انْتَهَيْتَ فَسَلْ So when you finish, then make dua and Allah will answer you, will give you. Allahu Akbar. So this is the second time in where the dua is accepted. You, you listen to the adhan of the Mu'addin. You repeat after the Mu'addin. Then you send prayers upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then you ask Allah al-wasila for Rasulullah. That is by saying, Allahumma rabba hadhi al-da'wati al-tamma wa salati al-qa'ima ati muhammadan al-wasilatu al-fadila. Wa ba'athu Allahumma maqama al-mahmood al-lazhi wa'atta. 
innaka la tukhlifu al mi'ad some say it's authentic some say it's not authentic but it's permissible to say it once you finish a dua after the adhan immediately don't stop make dua before salat al sunnah make dua because that is a moment in where the dua is accepted is accepted wal ulama rahimahumullah discussed a contemporary matter and that is concerning the ruling repeating after the mu'addin when the adhan is made on the mobile when the adhan is heard off the radio or on the mobile so sheikh ibn baz rahimahullah mentioned its permissibility so long as the time of the prayer has entered and you have not prayed yet this is the condition so if it is fajr time and your alarm your adhan clock or the radio or your phone began to recite the adhan and the time of fajr has entered in your city and you still haven't prayed then here it is permissible to repeat after the adhan that you you're hearing from your device and bi idhnillah you earn the same reward as that of the person that is in the masjid repeating after the muaddin wallahu a'lam now and it's not a condition that the adhan that's being made is live it could be a recorded adhan even though sheikh bin uthaymin rahimahullah he conditioned that the dua that the adhan being recited must be a live dua uh, must be a live adhan there is difference of opinion and there is no issue bi idhnillah in repeating after the muaddin as long as the time of the prayer has entered and you haven't prayed yet then in this case you repeat after the device that is making adhan so we said as soon as you hear the adhan you repeat after the muaddin you send praise upon rasulullah you say a dua allahumma rabb hadhihi da'wati at-tamma immediately after it you make a dua fasal tu'ta that's a time of an accepted dua the third time of an accepted dua is bayna al-adhan wa al-iqamah between the adhan and the iqamah so after you've made that adhan which is immediately after you've repeated after the muaddin and you've done the dua after the adhan you pray your sunnah then after that there is a time of an accepted dua until the iqamah when nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said ad dua la yuraddu bayna al-adhan wa al-iqamah dua is never rejected between the adhan and iqamah قالوا ماذا نقول يا رسول الله they said يا رسول الله what should we ask Allah for what should we make dua between adhan and iqama what, what dua should we make and here what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to answer is going to teach us that this is the best dua to say between adhan and iqama he said sallu Allah al-afiyat fi dunya wal akhirah he said ask Allah for protection in this life and the next and this is the best dua one of the best dua allahumma inni as'aluka al-afiyata fi dunya wal akhirah and continuously repeat it between adhan and iqama and why is the dua between adhan and iqama an accepted dua you know why because when allah called you to as-salah when the muaddin said hayya 'ala as-salah hayya 'ala al-falah when he said come to salat come to success you rushed and you ran to as salah you answered allah's command therefore in return allah answers your dua and he answers your call allahu akbar the fourth time of an accepted dua ibn al qayyim rahimahullah he said wa adbar as salawat al maktubat and at the end of the uh, at the uh, uh, he said at the end of the obligatory prayers at the end of the prayer meaning just before you conclude your salat just before you make taslim that is a time of an accepted dua when nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned this a long hadith and nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he taught his companions how to pray at the end of this hadith he said he taught them how to conclude the prayer he taught them 
how to say at tahiyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibatu wa salamu alaykum all the way until the end. And then he said to them, ثم يتخير من الدعاء أعجبه إليه فيدعو به. Then the Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم said, once you finish at tahiyat, you completed, you finished, then select and choose what you like of a dua. فادعو به and ask Allah whatever it is and ask Allah عز وجل and this is an incredible time to make dua because it's at the end of the prayer just before you say Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Wallahi my brothers and sisters in Islam until you understand how precious this time is and how important this time is let me tell you how important it is so you've made wudu you've faced the qibla you've said Allahu Akbar declaring Allah's greatness you stood facing Allah in your prayer. You've recited Al-Quran, the word of Allah. You've made ruku' and glorified Allah in your ruku'. Then you got up and you said, Sami' Allahu liman hamidah rabbana wa lakal hamd. And you've began to praise Allah. And then you made sujood and you glorified Allah. You humbled yourself before Allah. And then you repeated this rak'ah two times or three or four times. And then you finally sat for at tashahud which is a humble, submissive, obedient type of sitting. And after all this, you said, At-tahiyatu lillah, wassalawatu at-tayyibat. You said, greetings and prayers and all the good things belong to Allah. And then you made salat ala al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then you said the shahada, ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. After all this, now, you are in an excellent position to make dua. Don't leave a salat until you make a dua. You understand why this time was important and precious? Because it comes after doing all this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. This is why never conclude your salat except after making dua. And there is dua that is mentioned from the sunnah, like Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min athab al-nar, wa min athab al-qabr, wa min fitnat al-mahya wal-mamat, wa min fitnat al-masih al-dajjal. This dua is going to save you from the punishment of the grave, and it's going to save you from the fire, and it is going to save you from every fitna in this life, and during death, and it's going to save you from the biggest fitna, which is fitnat al-dajjal. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu to make a dua, Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi zulman kathira in another narration, kabira, wa innahu la yaghfiru al-dhunuba illa ant, faghfir li maghfiratan min indika warhamni, innaka anta al-ghafuru al-rahim. Make this dua before you make as-salamu alaykum, before you do a taslim. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, thumma yatakhayyar min al-dua. And then you can choose whatever dua you want that interests you and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The main thing is recognize the importance of this time before making taslim. The fifth time in where the dua is accepted. وَعِنْدَ صُعُودِ الْإِمَامِ يَوْمَ الْجُمُعَةِ عَلَى الْمِنْبَرِ حَتَّى تُقْضَى الصَّلَاةُ مِنْ ذَلِكَ يَوْمَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمِ وَآخَرُ سَاعَةٍ بَعْدَ الْعَصْرِ The fifth time in where the dua is accepted is on a Friday. When the Imam ascends the mimbar until the prayer finishes. And the last hour after Salat al Asr. And this is narrated by the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in where he said, Inna fil jumu'ati la sa'a. La yuafiquha abdun muslimun yusalli fiha. Yas'alu Allah ta'ala khayran illa a'tah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, verily, there is a moment, an hour. Now, now, when the hadith says an hour, it doesn't mean 60 minutes. Al-ulama, rahimahumullah, mentioned it's a moment of time. Wa-shaykh Salih al-Usaymi, hafizahullahu wa ra'ah, from our mashaykh, he said that a sa'a is approximately 45 minutes. The prophetic hour is approximately 45 minutes. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is saying there is a moment on Friday in where 
if a person was to be making dua during this time, Allah Azza wa Jal gives him what he wants. And the most authentic opinion concerning when this hour is are two opinions. Number one, from when the from when the Imam ascends the mimbar until the end of Salat al Jumu'ah. This entire time, from when the Imam ascends the mimbar until the end of Salat al Jumu'ah, this time is a time of an accepted dua. So, what does that mean? That means make sure you're saying Ameen when the Imam is making dua at the end of the khutbah, because the dua at the end of the khutbah is fitting within this moment of an accepted dua. Then Make dua when the imam sits down between the two khutbah. Make dua during this time. And then make dua in the sujood of Salat al-Jumu'ah and dua before the salam of Salat al-Jumu'ah. Then this is how you achieve making dua during this time in where the imam ascends the member until he concludes Salat al-Jumu'ah. And the second time on a Friday that is mentioned and has an authentic hadith to it is the time after Asr until sunset. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah in his book Zad al-Ma'ad he supported that the accepted time of dua on a Friday is the time after Asr until sunset. And he said this is the correct opinion. However, Ibn Hajar rahimahullah he mentioned both opinions and he supported both opinions. And he said, this suits the generosity of Allah Why are we? Why are we limiting it, limiting it to one opinion? He says, it is the two times in where Allah Azzawajal accepts the dua of the servant. Subhanallah. With Salaf rahimahumullah, it was known. Many, many of them on a Friday, they would pray Asr and would remain seated in their position until Adhan al-Maghrib. All this time making dua. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And you reflect over that and then compare it to your situation. How many of us are making five minute dua? How many, how many of us are making a 10 minute dua? And how many of us are neglecting this time altogether? For if you're serious about an accepted dua, then focus at this time. The third matter now. Now these are the six times we mentioned them. The third matter that is required for a dua that is never rejected. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said, وَصَادَفَ خُشُوعًا فِي الْقَلْبِ وَانْكِسَارًا بَيْنَ يَدَيَ الرَّبِّ وَذُلًّا لَهُ Allahu Akbar. He said, and that this dua must be with deep focus and concentration of the heart. And that a person must be broken in between the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal lahu and humbled before Allah Azza wa Jal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he described the dua of the prophets he said وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ Allah Azza wa Jal described the prophets when they made dua he said وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ they were humble and submissive to us. Their hearts were full of khushu' and concentration. Mujahid rahimahullah said, Al khushu' huwa al khawf al mulazim fi al qalb. Al khushu' is the fee that is instilled in the heart. Khashi'een, a khaifina khawfan azeeman, yahmiluhum ala al khudu' wal inkisar. The ulama rahimahullah said, that khushu' of the heart means that a person has fear of Allah Azza wa Jal, a great amount of fee that leads a person to being humble and broken before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're speaking about a positive fear of Allah. You know, don't understand this idea of fearing Allah as something negative. The negative fear of Allah is the fee that cripples a person and disables a person. And makes a person lose hope in Allah Azza wa Jal altogether. That's not the fee that is required. That is, that is bad fee. We don't need that fee. 
the positive and the correct fee that we're supposed to have of Allah Azzawajal is the fee that allows us to go closer to him. It's the fee that makes us get up and worship him more. The true and the positive fear of Allah is that which leads to more action, that which leads to humility and brokenness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our fear of Allah azza wa jal must give us hope in his mercy and his uh, forgiveness subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then focus on the heart having khushu' when making dua. As we said, al khushu' is the abundant fee in the heart that leads to your brokenness and weakness before Allah azza wa jal. A sign of khushu' could be that you cry in your dua. A sign of khushu' of, 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 of the heart is that you prolong your dua and you're focused and concentrated and you believe and you're focused that you are in a deep conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fourth matter of a dua that is never rejected, وَتَضَرُّعًا وَرِقَّةً as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, fourth matter now, تَضَرُّعًا that the dua is made with humility and desperation. The attitude of a dua must be in desperation. What does that mean? Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in the Quran concerning this matter, Ud'u Rabbakum tadarru'an wa khufiyah. Allah Azza wa Jal said, make dua to Allah tadarru'an with tadarru'a. Tadarru'a is desperation and humility. Now, look at the word tadarru'a. It comes from the word dir'a. And dir'a is the udder of the cattle. You know the cattle? So let's say you had a cow. The ara, the ara, where the milk is stored. That in Arabic is called a dira. Now, see that dira, this ada of the cattle? See how in desperate need the baby is of it? Yani the baby cow, the calf, he rushes to the ada of the mother. And he cannot live without that milk, without that udder. So our attitude when making dua should be like the attitude of this calf to the udder of its mother. Yeah, and anyway, we're clinging onto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are in desperate need of Allah azza wa jal. That's the attitude you're supposed to have when making dua. Tadarru' lillahi azza wa jal fi dua Tadarru' implies our desperate need for Allah azza wa jal. Without Allah, we will definitely die, spiritually and physically. Just like that calf, without the milk of its mother, it would die. It would die. It won't live. Unless someone takes it and looks after it, but out in the wild, in the natural, if its mother ran away or its mother died and no one came to the rescue of the calf, it would literally die. Give it a few hours, a few days, it's gone. So how desperately in need is this calf to its milk, uh, to the milk of its mother? That's the type of attitude we're supposed to have when making dua. That's, that is at tadarru fi dua at tadarru fi dua The fifth matter, <clears throat> of an accepted dua, a dua that is never rejected, was al-da'i al-qibla, that you face the qibla. Now, facing the qibla is from the manners of dua, not from the conditions of dua. And this has been reported in many hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For example, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Zayd. He mentions that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came out and he prayed al-istisqa, which is the prayer for rain, and he made a khutbah. In the hadith it says, وَاسْتَقْبَلَ الْقِبْلَةَ وَدَعَى That Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faced the qibla and he began to ask. He began to ask. So it's from the manners as well to face the qibla when making dua. And this is from the reasons why dua is accepted. The sixth matter is as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, وَكَانَ عَلَىٰ طَهَارَةٍ And this is again from the manners of a dua, not from the conditions. And that is, كَانَ عَلَىٰ طَهَارَةٍ You are upon purity. That means you've made wudu. Why? 
because wudu cleanses you and purifies you from your sins. And the sins are the biggest barrier between our dua being accepted and not, uh, يعني, between our dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The biggest barrier between us and our dua being accepted is our sins. So what does wudu do? Wudu cleanses us and purifies us from our sins. So make wudu. Now when you have removed all these sins, this barrier between you and Allah, now make dua. Your dua in is, is in a better position for it to be accepted. Even though, as I said, the dua is not a condition, but it's from the manners. And if you had wudu when making dua, that dua most likely will never be rejected. The seventh matter, وَرَفَعَ يَدَيْهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ الله أكبر. Ibn Al-Qayyim رحمه الله said, وَرَفَعَ يَدَيْهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ This is also from the manners of dua, not from the conditions. And that is to raise your hand when making dua. Let's discuss this. Where did this come from? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in the hadith, إِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ حَيِّيٌّ كَرِيمٌ يَسْتَحْيِي مِنْ عَبْدِهِ أَنْ يَرْفَعَ إِلَيْهِ يَدَيْهِ فَيَرُدَّهُمَا صِفْرًا أَوْ قَالَ خَائِبَتَيْنِ this hadith is authentic. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Verily, Allah is shy and he's generous. He's shy in a way that befits his majesty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Allah is shy when his slave raises his hand to him to turn them away empty and disappointed. Allahu Akbar. Al-Ghani, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Kareem, he is shy of his servant. Yes, he is shy. If you were to raise your hand, he's shy to turn, you the, to turn your hands away in disappointment and to turn them empty. Allahu Akbar. And how is a person supposed to raise his hands when making dua? There are many forms, my brothers and sisters in Islam. However, the most common forms are two. That is to join the hands together. There is a difference of opinion concerning moving the hands away. Uh, but let's speak about the common forms. To join the hand together. So like this. Hand joined together. And then the hands facing your face like this. That's one common form. And the other common form is for the hands to be joined together and facing the sky like this. Hands facing up, facing the sky. These are the two common forms. And this, this, if you looked at this, this image, it is a sign. It implies a humili a hu a humility. It's an image of a beggar, <clears throat> of a person that is in desperate need. So this is humility before Allah Azza wa Jal when you do this. You're opening your hands and you only open them for Allah Azza wa Jal. Not to the creation. Don't open your hands to the creation. Open them for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As though you're asking Allah, give me. Give me what I want. Because when you open your hand, you're ready to take something. So how is Allah azza wa jal going to reject you and return you empty-handed? This is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah is shy. If a servant was to raise his hand, that Allah return him zero. Yani, <laughs> Wallahi, wallahi, among us humans, if you went to a shopping center and someone opened his hand and said to you, give me, wouldn't you be shy to say, oh, you get away from me, I don't want to give you? Wallahi, even if you didn't want to give anyone, you will put something in his pot in his hand. You see, embarrassed for him. Wallillahi al-mathal al-a'la to Allah belongs the highest of examples. When you open your hands like this and face them to the sky or face them to your hand, you're begging Allah Azza wa Jal, you want something. Allah Azza wa Jal is shy to return them zero and empty. Allahu Akbar. And in real desperate times, such as al-istisqa, the prayer for rain, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would raise his hand so much that the whiteness of his armpits would show. So it might not show on the camera, but he would do this. He would raise them all the way up and the whiteness of his armpits would be shown, right? And this is in the hadith, as mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, that كان وَإِنَّهُ يَرْفَعُ حَتَّى يُرَى بَيَاضُ إِبْطِيهِ 
He would raise them until the whiteness of his armpit would be showing. And he also did this in a time of desperation in the battle of Badr, when the believers were facing the disbelievers. The first battle in Islam, a crucial, critical moment in the, in, in the Islamic history. He raised his hand so much until his cloak fell off and he continued to make dua. So in times of desperation, raise your hand all the way to the top until the armpits are showing. Now, also during al-istisqa, the prayer for rain, there is a hadith that also mentions that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's palms were facing the earth and his hand was raised high above like this. So his, 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 uh, the palm was facing down and his hands were facing up. That is also a form uh, of the hands when making dua for rain. When making dua for rain. Now, طيب. And look, all there, there are many forms. I'm not going to go through them all, but I will refer you to the reference where you will find all this. Uh, there is a, uh, the book for Ibn Rajab, Jami' al-Ulum wal-Hikam. Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, has a book. It's titled Jami' al-Ulum wal-Hikam. In the 10th hadith, he explains all the forms of how the, the hands are raised when making dua. So you can go there and, and read on the, on the forms. طيب. And then there are times in which the hand must not be raised when making dua. For example, during the dua of the khatib on a Friday. So when the imam is doing a khutbah on Friday, it is not a sunnah to raise your hands and say ameen, except when the imam makes a dua for rain. We can raise our hand and say ameen. And of course, this matter, there is a difference of opinion about it. And also, the hand must not be raised during tawaf and sa'i. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant us a visit to his house very soon. But when making tawaf and, and sa'i, it is not from the sunnah to raise your hand and make dua. Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made tawaf, made sa'i, and did dua during these two things. And he did not raise his hand when made, making dua. Nothing was reported about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam raising his hand when making dua during tawaf or sa'i. The eighth matter is, وَبَدَأَ بِحَمْدِ اللَّهِ وَالثَّنَاءِ عَلَيْهِ The eighth matter, in where the dua is not rejected, rather it's accepted, is to start your dua by praising Allah in abundance. ثُمَّ ثَنَّى بِالصَّلَاةِ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ عَبْدِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. And then, to send prayers upon Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. And there is a hadith for this. This is the narration of Fudal ibn Ubaid رضي الله عنه. He said, سمع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رجلا يدعو في صلاته. And Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم heard a man making dua in his salat. Now this could mean him making dua while he's praying or after the salat. And this man that made dua, لم يحمد الله, he did not praise Allah. ولم يصلي على النبي, and he did not send prayers upon Rasulullah. فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم, عاجل هذا. النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم said, this person rushed his dua. Then the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, إذا صلى أحدكم, Whenever any one of you prays and wants to make dua, فَلْيَبْدَأْ بِتَحْمِيدِ رَبِّهِ Start by praising Allah. وَالثَّنَاءِ عَلَيْهِ Glorify Allah. ثُمَّ يُصَلِّ عَلَى النَّبِي Then send prayers upon Rasulullah. ثُمَّ يَدْعُ بَعْدُ بِمَا شَاءَ Then after that, make dua for whatever you like. For it is very important to start your dua by praising Allah. You raise your hands. اللهم لك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا اللهم لك الحمد على كل حال right and just the, the plenty and plenty of dua that is a praise of Allah عز وجل praise Allah then say اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد then make dua after that and halfway in your dua Say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad again, 
And when you conclude your dua, praise Allah and send prayers upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once again. That's the, the best form in how a dua is made and how it started in the middle and how it ends. And my brothers and sisters in Islam, this is why uh, the dua after the adhan is answered. Why? Because when you repeat after the mu'adhin, you are praising Allah. When the mu'adhin said Allahu Akbar, you said Allahu Akbar. You praised Allah. Then after the adhan, you sent prayers upon Rasulullah. Yeah? Then you say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad, which is a sunnah to do. So you've praised Allah, you've sent prayers upon the Prophet, and now the dua is accepted. This is why the dua after the adhan is accepted, because it comes after Allah being praised and after sending prayers upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also, this is why the dua at the end of the prayer, before the taslim, is also accepted. Because it comes after you praise Allah. At-tahiyatu lillah wa salawatu wa tayyibat. That is praising Allah. Greetings and all good things belongs to Allah. And then you prayed upon Rasulullah. You said at-tahiyatu lillah wa salatu. And then you said Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammad. So you've praised Allah. You've sent prayers upon Rasulullah. And now you're in a correct position to make dua. So the dua just before the taslim is accepted because it comes after Allah is being praised and after you've sent prayers upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is why also a dua in a sujood is answered because it comes after praising Allah. You know, when, when you're in ruku' and you come up, you say, Sami'allahu liman hamidah, which means Allah answers the dua of the one who praises him. Then what do you do? You praise Allah. You say Allah, you say, Rabbana walaka alhamd, hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi. Right? And then the, the, the dua is long. But you praise Allah. Then you go into sujood. Now make dua. Because this dua in sujood comes after you've praised Allah when you are standing. And you said, Sami Allahu liman hamida. That Allah answers the dua of the one who praises him. So you've just praised him. So now go down to sujood and make dua. Because this dua is coming after you have praised Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, very important. The ninth matter, the ninth matter of an accepted dua, or of a dua that is never rejected. ثُمَّ قَدَّمَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ حَاجَتِهِ التَّوْبَةَ وَالْإِسْتِغْفَارِ And then, after you have praised Allah, sent prayers and blessings upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after that, seek forgiveness for your sins. Before you start your dua in what you want, ask Allah to forgive your sins. Very important. Because the sins, as I said, are a barrier between you and an accepted dua. So, may, say Allahumma ghfir li dhunubi. And the best dua you can make, uh, and, and, and actually this, this um, uh, what do we call it? This, uh, this thing of praising Allah, sending prayers upon Rasulullah, and then starting by seeking forgiveness of your sins, this pattern, we find it in dua uh, Sayyid al-Istighfar. Sayyid al-Istighfar. In where we praised Allah, and then we sought his forgiveness from our sins. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant. You're my Lord. There is no Lord worthy of worship but you. Khalaqtani, you created me. Wa ana abduk. I am your slave. Wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'adika wa stata'at. And I am upon my agreement with you as best as I can. Which is the agreement of I will worship you. La ilaha illa Allah. A'udhu bika min sharri ma sana'at. I seek your protection from every evil I have done. Abu ulaka bi ni'matika alay. I acknowledge your benefit, uh, your goodness and favors upon me. Wa abu ulaka bi dhambi. And I acknowledge to you my sins. Faghfir li. Forgive me. Why? Inna hu la yaghfir al-dhunuba illa ant. Because who can I turn to? No one forgives sins except you. So before you make dua, start by seeking forgiveness of your sins. Very important, very important. Sins are a blockage 
between us and a dua that is accepted. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned this clearly in the hadith about a person who raises his hand to the sky in dua and he says, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb. Look at, he's begging, he's crying to Allah. But then in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that such a person's dua is rejected. Why? Mat'amuhu haram, mashrabuhu haram, albasuhu haram, ghudhiya bil haram. His food is haram, his drink is haram, his clothing is haram, he's nourished and nurtured by al haram. How can his dua be accepted if he's all sins on top of sin? His food being haram doesn't only mean he's eating something haram, could be his income is haram. From drugs and selling impermissible matters, he steals money, he cheats and deceives people in business, his money is from ar riba. All of this makes your food haram now and you're drinking haram because it came from a haram source. And the clothing, the clothing as well. If the clothing is haram, it could stand between you and accepted dua. And here there is an important note to mention to people that say, oh, it's all about the heart. doesn't matter about the physical appearance. Allah doesn't look at the physical appearance. He looks at the heart. Yes, there is a hadith. But the hadith says that Allah Azza wa Jal does not look at your physical appearance. He looks and he judges you by the heart. But that hadith cannot be read alone. You need to put that hadith with this hadith as well. In when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions that dua of a person is rejected because his clothing was haram. His clothing was haram. This is a big deal, my brothers and sisters in Islam. So the one who is wearing impermissible clothing Change that and he adhere to Islamic clothing so that your dua could be accepted. The brother that is wearing haram clothing, tight clothing, clothing above the knees. And he only thinks that he has to cover his knees when he prays. And then after that, it's okay. La, al-awra must always be covered at all times. And then the sister who wears whatever she likes, calling this modesty, calling this al-hijab fashion and style and whatever names they've given it today, whatever names the shaytan has given it today, because this has nothing to do with modesty. This kind of clothing that is un-Islamic, it prevents the dua from being accepted. It blocks your dua from being accepted. For my advice to my brothers and sisters in Islam, your clothing is important for an accepted dua. Yes, your clothing is important for an accepted dua. And I'll repeat this from now till tomorrow. Don't, don't separate between Allah Azzawajal's commands and say this is one thing and this is another. La, ad-deen is all one. Udkhulu fi silmi kafatan, Allah says. Enter in complete submission to Allah. You want your dua accepted? Then adhere to all the matters that we're supposed to for an accepted dua and keep away from all matters that result in a rejected dua. One of these matters, as we said, clothing that is haram. We ask Allah Azza wa for strength, that He give us the ability and the strength to always adhere to His commands, whether it's in our clothing, our food, our drink, in the way we live, in how we sleep, in how we wake up, in all our, our matters. Uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal for that. Now, my brothers and sisters in Islam, the tenth matter for a dua that is never rejected. ثم دخل على الله وألح عليه في الدعاء. The tenth matter is to enter upon Allah. يعني now, once again, this is a repetition of the earlier meanings of being focused and concentrated in your dua. وألح عليه في المسألة. The tenth matter is repetition in dua. So do not rush, repeat your dua and repeat it and keep repeating and keep repeating and don't stop. And this is found in the Quran. In Surah Ali Imran, at the end of this surah, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the believers when they were making dua to him. So Allah Azza wa Jal said that these believers said, Rabbana, 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 innaka man tudkhilinnaa, Rabbana, innana sami'na munadiya, Rabbana, amanna fa... They continuously say, Rabbana, Rabbana, Rabbana. At the end, what was the result? The last page in Surah Ali Imran at the top, Allah says, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ Allah answered their dua. 
إذن the secret is the repetition وألح عليه في المسألة repetition in dua results in a dua being accepted never rejected and there is a hadith as well that is narrated that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua in Masjid al-Fatih on three days Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday this hadith is argued some say it's authentic, some say it's weak. However, there's something important we can learn from this hadith that no one would disagree to. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So Allah answered his dua on Wednesday between Dhuhr and Asr. Now there is something here to clarify. Some people said that this means on Wednesday between Dhuhr and Asr is a time of an accepted dua. But that's not right. The dua is not teaching us, the, the hadith is not teaching us this. The hadith is teaching us that the dua that is repeated is what will be answered. Let the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua on Monday, then Tuesday, then Wednesday, and Allah answered him on Wednesday between Dhuhr and Asr. So the key, the key lesson from this dua, from this hadith is the repetition. Keep going with your dua, don't stop. If you, if you need, if, if there's a difficult calamity in your life. Allahumma rafa anni al-bala, Allahumma yassir amri, Allahumma yassir amri, oh Allah, make my affairs easy, make my affairs easy. Repeat it today, and tomorrow, and after tomorrow, and keep on going until Allah Azza wa eases your affairs. Repetition in a dua is important. You know, and the repetition in dua means you saying, oh Allah, I will keep asking you. I will not turn away until you give me what I want. Had there someone like that, you think Allah would reject him and turn him away? No. Allah would answer him. You're, you're on the door. You're knocking the door. You're knocking the door. You are continuously knocking Allah's door and you're not giving up. Such a person, Allah will open for him. And Allah will give him what he wants. Bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. Repetition in a dua shows desperation. It proves your desperation. It proves your humility. It proves your brokenness before Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is exactly what's required for a dua that is never rejected. The 11th matter. Oh, Allahu Akbar. This is a beautiful one. He said, وَتَمَلَّقَهُ <clears throat> Allahu Akbar. Listen to this. وَتَمَلَّقَهُ فِي الدُّعَاءِ you know what this means. Perhaps this is the first time you hear this word. التملق في الدعاء. العلماء رحمهم الله they say التملق هو التودد بالكلام التودد بكلام لطيف وتضرع فوق ما ينبغي. التملق is loving and gentle, peaceful words that you say with extreme desperation for Allah عز وجل. التملق Your dua must be with loving, gentle, peaceful words. If your dua contain that, then that dua is almost certainly accepted, never rejected. Give you an example. Like the dua of Zakaria alayhi salam. You know the dua of Zakaria? Allah, what a beautiful dua. He said, Rabbi inni wahana al-azmu minni. Now this is an example of what tamalluq is. What loving and gentle and peaceful words in a dua means. Look at the dua of Zakaria. He says, Rabbi inni wahana al-azmu minni. My Lord, my bones have become weak. No, he didn't say I've become weak. He's saying my bones have become weak. He didn't say my heart has became weak. Like my bones, because the heart of the believer is always strong. It's never weak. And, and look what, he, it's as though he's putting the blame on the, on, the, on the bones. Look at his loving words to Allah. He's saying to Allah, it's not me, Allah. It's the bones. The bones have become weak. And my hair on my face, يعني, all of it, the beard, the moustache, the eyebrows, the hair, has all gone gray. It's on fire. You know, when, when, when you light something uh, on fire, like a coal, and then it burns, it becomes white, then becomes gray, ash. That's how his hair has become white. Meaning he's very old. 
He said, and why, my Lord, I have never been miserable when making dua. Meaning, I have never once given up when making dua. I never feel bad when making dua. This is tamalluq. Look at the gentle, soft words he's saying. He's talking to Allah and he knows Allah is hearing him. These are peaceful, gentle words. Then he says, look, look at his dua. وَإِنِّي خِفْتُ الْمَوَالِيَ مِنْ وَرَائِي He said, oh my Lord, I fear the successes after me. I fear for the generations and the children and the people that are going to come after I die. Who's going to guide these people? Who's going to teach them their deen? وَكَانَتِ امْرَأَةِ عَاقِرٍ Oh Allah, my wife is barren. She can't even conceive and get pregnant. فَهَبْ لِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيَّ Please, Ya Allah, give me, grant me, gift me. And a, 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 a person, gift me a child, Milladunk, especially from you. I don't know. I know my situation is impossible. I'm old. My wife can't conceive. Milladunk, something special. Give me something special from you. Yarithuni, give me a child that will inherit me. Wayarithu min ali Yaqub. And he inherits from the family of Yaqub, meaning inherits knowledge. Because the prophets, they don't inherit money and worldly matters and houses and whatever. No, they inherit knowledge. So give me a child that would inherit knowledge and prophethood from me and from the family of Yaqub. And my Lord, make this child pleasing to you. Be pleased with him. That is gentle, loving, compassionate words when making dua. A tamalluq is to talk about your intention to Allah. Why are you asking Allah for such a thing? You see, Yaqub alayhi salam, oh, sorry, when Zakaria made a dua, he said, oh Allah, give me a child so he can take the knowledge and prophethood. I want a child so he can look after generations that come after me, so he can teach them their deen. See the intention? See the tamalluq? He's talking about his intention for why he's asking Allah what he wants. So when you make dua and you ask Allah what you want, Tell Allah why you want it, even though Allah knows. But at-tamalluq, at-tamalluq fi dua is for you to express. Ya Allah, bring it all out. Speak. You're in a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so don't hold back. And even, yani, subhanallah, in the case of the wife of Imran, which is the mother of Maryam alayhi salam, in which she said, Rabbi inni nadhartu laka ma fi batni muharrara. She said, oh my Lord, I have dedicated whatever is in my womb for your sake. I have dedicated whatever is in my womb for your worship. Look at that. She didn't donate what's in her pocket. She donated what's in her body for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when Allah azza wa jal gave her a child, gave her Maryam, when she was wanting a boy, she then said to Allah azza wa jal, uh, she said, Oh my Lord, this is a girl. The story is long. Why she يعني, mentioned this to Allah Azza wa Jal. But the idea is dua. be gentle and calm, loving in your dua, loving words. The twelfth matter is وَدَعَاهُ رَغْبَةً وَرَهْبَةً. As Ibn Al-Qayyim Rahimahullah said, and he made dua in, uh, with hope and fee, hoping for the reward from Allah Azza wa Jal, fearing Allah's rejection. And this is the dua of the prophets. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in the Quran, وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا They used to make dua to Allah, hoping for Allah Azza wa Jal's mercy and fee that Allah might reject their deeds and their worship and their dua. So when making dua, Make dua, hoping, hoping, hope, real hope in Allah's mercy. And fee as well. Fee Allah. He might reject this dua. But this fee, once again, should not lead you to losing hope. This, this fee should inspire you to keep making dua and repeat it and keep repeating it until it's accepted. The 13th matter, وَتَوَسَّلَ إِلَيْهِ بِأَسْمَائِهِ وَصِفَاتِهِ وَتَوْحِيدِهِ The 13th matter is that التوسل, التوسل, that you ask Allah Azza wa Jal through his names, 
through his names and attributes and his oneness. That's very important. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, قُلِ ادْعُوا اللَّهَ وَادْعُوا الرَّحْمَانِ أَيَّمْ مَا تَدْعُوا فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى Allah Azza wa Jal said, ask Allah through his name Allah or through his name Ar-Rahman. Whichever name you choose to ask Allah through, then to Allah belongs all perfect names. Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا to Allah belongs the most perfect of names, the excellent names. So ask him through his names. So that means if you want mercy, say, Ya Rahman, Irhamni. O oh, the most merciful, have mercy upon me. O oh, the all forgiving, forgive me. Ya Ghaffar, Ya Ghafoor, Irfirli. If you want wisdom and knowledge, you say, Ya Alim, Ya Hakim, Alimni, Fahimni. Right? This is asking Allah through his names. And seeking, seeking through your tawheed of Allah, a way to Allah. So ask Allah Azza wa Jal through your tawheed. And this is the greatest form of an accepted dua. The greatest form of tawassul, sorry. I mean, because a tawassul, a tawassul is to seek through something a way to Allah. So seek through your tawheed of Allah, seek through your oneness of Allah, a way to Allah. And this is found in the hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he heard a man say, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi annaka anta Allahu la ilaha illa ant. Al-ahadu al-samad al-lazhi lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard someone began his dua like this. He said, Oh Allah, I ask you by the fact that I bear witness that you are Allah. There is none worthy of worship but you, the only Lord. You are a samad, independent of all your creation, and they are in need of you. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. You have never had a child, nor are you a child to anyone. Walam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. And you are never equal to anyone. This man made his dua like this. He started like this. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَقَدْ سَأَلَ اللَّهَ بِاسْمِهِ الْأَعْظَمُ That this man asked Allah through the greatest name of Allah. إِذَا سُئِلَ بِهِ أَعْطَى وَإِذَا دُعِيَ بِهِ أَجَابُ That this name of Allah, if Allah was to be called through this name, He will answer that person. And if something was requested from Allah through this name, Allah Azza wa Jal would answer that person. Allahu Akbar. Very important to start your dua with this dua. Allahumma inni as'aluka bi anni. Here we go. I've put it up. Allahumma inni as'aluka bi anni ashadu annaka anta Allah. La ilaha illa anta al-ahadu al-samad al-lazhi lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. The one who asks Allah through this dhikr, his dua will definitely, definitely be accepted. 14th matter, and this is the last matter. We're coming to the conclusion now. And you give a sadaqah after your dua. After you've completed your dua, give a sadaqah. Do a good deed. Give someone something. Give the poor, give the needy, give the beggar. Send the charity overseas, online. Do something. Give a sadaqah. Help someone that is in need. Why? Because a sadaqah, it extinguishes the anger of Allah, as mentioned in the hadith. What does that mean? If it distinguishes the anger of Allah, that means it earns a person Allah's pleasure. This is what the sadaqah does. Then Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said at the end of his work, فَإِنَّ هَذَا الدَّعَاءَ الدُّعَاءَ لَا يَكَادُ يَرَدُّ أَبَدًا After all these 14 matters that we just shared together, he said, this type of dua that includes all these 14 matters is a dua that is almost certainly never, ever rejected. Rather, it is accepted and answered in the manner Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees it befitting for a person. Then Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said, وَلَا سِيَّمَا إِذَا صَادَفَ الْأَدْعِيَةِ 
التي أخبر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنها مظنة الإجابة أو أنها مظنة لسمه الأعظم He said especially if all these 14 matters were to go alongside the greatest name of Allah اسم الله الأعظم asking Allah through his greatest name and you know the hadith that I shared with you before اللهم إني أسألك بأنك أنت الله لا إله إلا أنت الواحد الأحد الفرد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد Some ulama have said that this is the grand name of Allah Others said as in another hadith that is found in Abi Dawood and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting and a man was praying and then this man made dua and he said اللهم إني أسألك بأن لك الحمد لا إله إلا أنت المنان بديع السماوات والأرض يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا حي يا قيوم He said this, this man made this dua and then he asked النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم he said لقد دع الله باسمه الأعظم He just asked Allah with the greatest name of Allah الذي إذا دعي به أجاب He just asked Allah with a name that if Allah Azzawajal was to be asked through this name, Allah would answer. And if Allah, if you, if, if something was requested from Allah through this name, Allah would give. Allahu Akbar. For this is very important for us to memorize and to learn. Well, ulama, rahimahumullah, as I told you, they have differed among each other. What is the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What is the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? A lot of khilaf. However, there is one thing that we will find true. And that is, if we gather all these dua together that speak about the greatest name of Allah, we will find one name that is in common. And that is the name Allah. This is the greatest name of Allah. It is actually Allah, this name. So when making dua, after praising Allah, sending blessings upon Rasulullah, say, Ya Allah, I ask you for whatever. Ya Allah, I ask you for whatever. And then bring a name of Allah that is suitable for what you're asking. You're asking Allah to increase your knowledge. Say, Ya Alim, Zidni Ilma. Right? You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you a clear conscience and good decision making. Ya Fattah, Iftah Ali. Right? And use the names of Allah according to whatever you're asking. This kind of dua almost certainly will never ever be rejected. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Jazakumullahu khaira. This is all I have uh, يعني, to share with you today. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make that which we heard of benefit. نسألك يا الله بأن لك الحمد لا إله إلا أنت المنان بديع السماوات والأرض يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا حي يا قيوم أن تغفر لنا ذنوبنا وأن ترحمنا وأن تجيرنا من عذاب النار وأن ترزقنا الإخلاص في القول والعمل وأن تدخلنا الجنة وتباعدنا من النار اللهم اعتق رقابنا من النار ورقاب آبائنا وأبنائنا وأمهاتنا وذوي أرحامنا ومن له حق علينا ومن أحبنا فيك ومن أحببناه فيك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم ثبت قلوبنا على الإيمان اللهم يا مقلب القلوب والأبصار ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم يا مقلب القلوب والأبصار ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم يا مصرف القلوب والأبصار صرف قلوبنا إلى طاعتك وتقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا اللهم إنا نستغفرك لما لا نعلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما نعلم يا رب العالمين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وجزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته